All right, 2 Kings chapter number 2. 2 Kings chapter number 2. We'll read this. Why don't you stand just for a second? 2 Kings 2. We'll be in a couple different places here, but notice 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse number 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. Yes. Brother Gorski, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, please? Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. It's been a good journey through the life of Elijah. Amen. We started off with the trials of our faith, the reality that trials happen to God's servants. We moved on to trust in our faith, dealing with the risk of trusting God. We talked about the triumph of our faith, the reward for standing up for God. When Elijah was on top of the Mount Carmel, with the false prophets. We moved on yesterday to the trouble in our faith. Not just doing something for God, but God doing something for us. The rescue that God brings to His depressed and discouraged servants. Today I want us to look at Elijah and Elisha 
And we're going to talk about the transferring of our faith. The transferring of our faith. You see, this is really the last part of Elijah's life. We have the departing of Elijah and the dawn of Elisha. And so the idea of transferring your faith is in several ways we can make application, but one real practical way all of us can make application is that we're going to take what we have gotten from God on this mountain and we're going to take it down in the valley with us. And we're going to put shoe leather on it. And we're going to work out what God has worked in. We're going to transfer our faith, Lord willing, by His grace. And you know, it's not all just about you. It's about what God can do through you for other people. We know we've kind of had a sub-theme and there's all kind of sub-points and sub-points, but I think the idea of community, the idea of the body of Christ has been real prevalent in this camp. It's not just about you individually. You influence and you encourage and you help others. And I think that's been real dominant in camp. And so the idea is that we should be a positive, good influence on our spouses, on our friends, on our church members, the body of Christ around us. It reminds me of a story of a husband and wife. They were out of town on vacation. And they uh, had a problem there. They had to stop into the local dentist. We have any people in the dental field? They're not very loved. But they had to stop in because of a tooth problem. You ever had a bad tooth? Till dentist on vacation and uh, the wife goes up and she's like, we got to talk to the dentist. We have an emergency. And uh, she begins to talk to the dentist. She says, look, we are in a hurry. So we need a tooth extracted. We don't want Novocaine. We don't want gas. We don't want anything. We got to get on the road. We've got places to go, people to see, things to do. So let's go ahead and get this thing done. And the man looks at the, uh, the dentist looks at the wife. He says, wow, you're very courageous. Which tooth is it? And she looks over at her husband. She says, show him your tooth, dear. (laughs) (laughs) Now, that's not the kind of encouragement that we ought to be. Now, we ought to bear one another's burdens. But we're going to talk about the departing of Elijah and the dawn of Elisha. Now, first of all, I want us to go back to chapter 1 of 2 Kings. And I want us to talk about the content of our faith. The content of our faith. Here in 2 Kings chapter 1, Ahab has died and Ahaziah his son has taken over in the northern tribes of Israel. And Ahaziah is sick. In verse number 2, he sends messengers and says, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Verse 3, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they said unto him, He was an hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. (laughs) Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him and said, Behold, he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of an hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. 
And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. You'd think he'd get the message. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him. And said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Forasmuch as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. Verse 17, so he died according to the word of the Lord which Elijah had spoken. What is the content of your faith? Now you think about this. The men go and they tell Elijah to come down. And Elijah's getting ready to tell the Lord to come up. And that's exactly what this world's going to try to get you to do when you come down off of this mountain. They're going to try to get you to come down spiritually. You have a spiritual high and you've been walking with God and the question is, they're going to say, hey, can you compromise with the conflict? The question is going to be, can't you just come down a little bit? Can't you just lower your standards a little bit? Why do you have to be so dogmatic? Why do you have to be so right about everything? Why do you have to be so holier than thou? You know, that's actually a phrase in the Bible that the world's picked up on. So who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? No, I'm just saved. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'll tell you what, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. And people don't like to hear that. But the idea is, can't you just tone it down a little bit? Can't you just compromise? Can't you just come down? Why do you have to stay up so high and, and love Jesus so much? Can't you love some things of this world too? Can't you just be a little bit worldly? Can't you just leave those convictions God gave you on the mountain? Just leave them up there at Pilgrim Pines. That's what the world's going to say to you. You're going to feel it as soon as you come down this mountain. You're going to feel that pressure from the world. Things going to begin to seep in through those windows and through those air conditioning vents and it'll go up your nose and in your ears and in your head and you better watch it. This world says, come down. God says, you're going to go up. Notice the answer, not just the question, but the answer, verse number 10. He says, I can't come down because of who I am. If I be a man of God. I gave you the thing yesterday about your identification. And we have all this problem. People have a problem with identity. You need to get this idea of Christian identity. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Wow. There's certain things I can't do because of who I am. It doesn't mean that I'm not sinful enough that I might not enjoy it. I guarantee you there are pleasures in sin for a season. But it's off limits because of who I am. The content of your faith. You see, it's not just what you believe. It's who you are. Can't come down because of who I am. I can't come down, he says, because of what I preach. It's not just the man. It's the message. And you know, I understand this whole thing with the man being the message and it was a part of us. I get that. But the message is way more important than the messenger. God doesn't need Elijah, and God doesn't need you. Amen. God's got some Elishas, and he's got 7,000, and we're expendable. We can be replaced, but his message can never be replaced. Amen. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And so he says, I can't come down not just because of who I am, but because of what I preach. And he says, I can't come down not just that, but because of who I serve. Deuteronomy 4.24, the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. It's interesting, in verse number 6, they're quoting Elijah's words back to him when they come and say, come down. Because that's exactly what he told the king. He says, you're not going to come down from that chamber. You're going to die. You've went up into that bed, and you're going to stay in that bed. You're not coming down. So in a mocking manner, they go up, and they say, come down. They're throwing his words back at him. 
That's how the world does. The world is going to mock you. They're going to criticize you. They're going to condemn you when you try to do right. And Elijah says, I can't come down because of who I serve. The Lord our God is a consuming fire. You say, what's the test? Well, the test is whether or not Elijah is a man of God. And here's the question for the content of your faith. If you are a man of God, if you are a woman of God, if you're a child of God, you younger kids, let me ask you this. Where is your fire? Where is your fire? Will you come down? The content of your faith. What substance is it? What, what's there? Is there a fire kindling? Is there something inside of you that's greater than what this world has? The Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Are you a man of God? Are you a child of God? And look, I'm not walking around like, a, I hear all this IFB stuff. I'm not walking around like a Nicolaitan pastor, you know, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm a man of God, you women of God, and us men of God, Dr. Doofungus. Like Brother Lent said, Brother Lent said when he went to one of these big meetings and they had all of those introductions, you know how before the preacher gets, they get up and they introduce Dr. So-and-so, and he's the president of this college, and he's done all of these things, and he was recognized by the governor of our fair state, and he's Dr. So-and-so. And he said he was at one of those meetings and it was Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so. And somebody said, who are you? He says, I'm intern Lentz. They said, intern? He says, yeah, the intern cleans up all the messes that the doctors make. So what do we do? Well, we're either men of God or women of God, but it's not because of us, it's because of the fire. It's because our God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The content of our faith, this book should consume us. Should consume us. If you're going to pass on your faith like Elijah did to Elisha, if you're going to transfer your faith from the mountaintop experience down to the valley, I'm talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, into next week, next month. If you're going to transfer what God's done for you, there's got to be some substance there. There's got to be some fire there. Yes. Is the content of your Christian faith empty? Come on. Or is it full? Notice not just the content of your faith, but the consequence of your faith. Let's talk about Elisha. Now go back, if you will, to 1 Kings 19. Remember when the Lord told Elijah yesterday, we read it briefly, didn't spend a lot of time on it, but he said, look, I'm not done with you. I want you to go anoint Elisha to be prophet in thy room. Best I can tell, you got about 10 years that go by before 2 Kings chapter number 2. And he goes and meets Elisha and he anoints him. And the word Elisha means God is salvation is what that means. God is salvation. And so the consequence of your faith, in other words, if you're transferring your faith, there ought to be some, some consequences. There ought to be something that follows from it. And so Elijah is not just all by himself like he thinks. I'm the only one. God's like, no, you're not the only one. And I'm going to use your life. I'm going to pour your life, your spirit, if I can say that, into somebody else. I am here, I am standing on the shoulders of many great yes. preachers. Amen. And I think all of us pastors and preachers in here would admit that this morning. Amen. We are standing on the shoulders of some great men of God. Amen. They poured their life into us. Yes. And there ought to be some consequences of your faith, and that's what Elisha is. Elisha comes from Elijah pouring himself into this man. And it's interesting that phrase later on is used about Elisha. For those 10 years, all he was known as the guy that poured water on the hands of Elijah. He pours the water on the hands of Elijah and Elijah pours his spirit into him. And so you think about that for all those years, Elijah is just a servant. He's just a servant. But boy, he's going to do as we're going to, we don't have time to get into Elisha's life. But he does exactly the double the miracles that Elijah does. Exactly double the miracles. All right, notice his finding in 1 Kings 19, 19. 
He departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Notice his finding. Who is he? Well, he's just out there plowing with the oxen. Plowing with the last group of oxen at that. I gave you the verse in 1 Corinthians, God chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He hath chosen the, the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. The things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God's looking for some Elishas, some nobodies. And God's going to take somebody and he's going to help you to be able to encourage them just like he's used someone else to encourage you. There's consequences of your faith. So we see his finding. He's just a nobody. He's plowing oxen. Oxen and Elijah takes that mantle. A mantle was like a big overcoat. Uh, I, I picture it like in, in, in our hot area. We don't deal with this much. But you ever see someone, they're dressed in a, a suit but then they have maybe a big black overcoat on. And it's way bigger than their suit and it covers everything up. I picture it something like that. Maybe even something even more rugged than that. That Elijah, Elijah could even cuddle up in and sleep in at night. And he might have slept in that thing. I guarantee you it stunk. Man, it, it, he probably smelled like an old goat. But when Elijah put that mantle on Elisha. Elisha knew what that meant. He just laid it over his shoulder. Now, Elisha does not keep the mantle at that point. Elijah takes it back and puts it on. But he put that mantle on Elisha there. Not just his finding, but notice here in the text his forfeiting. Look what he gave up. I mean, here he is. He's a farmer. He's plowing with these oxen. Notice he left his position. There are consequences to your faith. In other words, God does something for you and he says, tag, you're it. You ever play that? Yeah. You tag them, you say, tag, you're it. God puts his mantle on you and says, you're it. You've got to leave some stuff at that point. You've got to leave your position. You've got to leave your parents. Leave father and mother and cleave to his wife is what he says in the marriage relationship. When you go over to the New Testament, things are a little bit different. Jesus says, hey, you got a man and he's plowing and he, and he looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. He's got a pa passage in Luke chapter number 9. He says, you got to forsake your mother and father and if you go back, you're not fit. Now what Elisha's doing here is he's going to say his final farewells. He left his position, he left his parents, and look at this, he left his possessions. It's just stuff. I don't know if we have any minimalist in here. Anybody a minimalist? Anybody? I know, Brother Randy, you used to, you lived in a tiny house for a long time. You're done with that, man. He's getting stuff anytime he turns around. But you know, uh, Americans, uh, we all have our garages, or we have our closets, or we have our junk rooms, or we have whatever. We have stuff, stuff, stuff. Did you see how many suitcases I brought out here to California? My wife packed me everything but the kitchen sink. <laughs> man, I had it all, man. Amen. Yeah. And uh, we have so much stuff. But can I remind you it's just stuff? $2,000 phone that you've got, it's just a piece of junk. It's a piece of junk. Those computers and those, those clothes, those, those uh, shoes that you paid so much money for, it's just stuff. Clothes that you, it's just stuff. The heirlooms and the things that passed down from great great grandma, it's just stuff. It's just trinkets. Well, it means so much to me. It's going to burn up one day. Yeah. Corey Ten Boom, maybe you know her story. She went through the Holocaust and things like that. And she was a great testimony for Jesus Christ. She made the statement. She said, I've learned in my life 
not to hold on to things too tightly. So when the Lord takes them, it doesn't hurt so bad. That's some good advice. Good advice. It all belongs to God. If He takes it, He takes it. It's just a car. Even if it does run off a battery. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Give me some gasoline. Yeah. Yeah. Diesel. <laughs> Let me burn a hole in the ozone layer. Yeah. stuff. It's just the ozone layer. <laughs> he left his position. He left his parents. He left his possessions. Hudson Taylor said, God is looking for some wicks to burn. The oil and fire come free. God's looking for some wicks to burn. The oil and fire come free. Hey, if you're willing to burn, God will light you up. I think it was John Wesley who originally made the statement that uh, he just sets himself on fire for God and people come to watch him burn. And other preachers have quoted that, but I think John Wesley, I think it originated with him. There was a chaplain, he was speaking to a soldier on a cot in a hospital, and the uh, soldier had lost his arm. And uh, the chaplain looked at him and he says, I'm so sorry, son, that you lost his arm. And the soldier said, no, sir, let me correct you. I didn't lose it. I gave it. I gave it. Brother Vince Massa, whom most of you know of, a great preacher from up north. When he was attending Bible school, he worked for General Motors. And upon graduating, he was offered to come and assist a small church. Some people at his job, which was very prestigious, they had a good package, they had retirement and all those kind of things. They said, look, maybe you need to hang on to your job and just take a leave of absence. And then if things don't work out of the church, you can come back. No, he said, no, I didn't do that. He said, I burned my bridges. Burned my bridges. That's what Elijah does. What does Elijah do? He takes the ox that he used to plow with and he kills them. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. There must be a sacrifice before there ever can be service. And he burned all the instruments. He destroyed the bridge. You've probably been to places around the country where they have a bridge made out of wood, the old bridges. And what they do is they would build a cover. It would be a covered bridge. And the reason it has a roof and a cover over it is to protect it from the elements. So you can always go back across. God says, that's not how it works. The consequences of your faith, when you begin the type of faith that you should have as a Christian... The consequences are you burn your bridges. And you say, I'm all in. I made a decision up on that mountain. 100%. I'm burning the bridges. If that means I'm going to have to lose some possessions, if that means I'm going to have to lose uh, some position, if that means I'm going to have to change some priorities, so be it. Some of you need to burn your bridges on the way down. Just go ahead and burn them. Light them up and burn them on the way down. Notice not just his forfeiting, not just his finding, but notice his following. 1 Kings 19, verse number 21. Look what it says. He arose and went after Elijah. F.W. Borum, he was an old-time preacher. He made the quote. Here's the quote. We make our decisions, and our decisions turn around and make us. So he made a decision right here. He rose up, and he followed Elijah. And for years, he's just known as Elijah's servant. Elijah's kind of a rough guy. I think Elijah, you know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, he says, uh, 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 if you're trying to get counsel, I'm, I'm, I'm free quoting it. He says, counsel in the man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. I think that's how it goes. Some of you younger people, let me encourage you here to get around some of the older saints. But you're going to have to draw it out of them. It's not up to them to sit down and say, hey, sonny boy, let me give you some advice. It's not up to them to do that. You should have some respect, some reverence, 
And you should have some desire inside of you to draw out some wisdom from these older saints of God. Elijah was kind of a rough guy. He says, hey, all right, whatever you want to do, you want to go back and say bye to them? I don't know. I'm just doing what God told me to do. We can talk about Elijah in a little different way, but it was up to Elijah. And, 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 and here's Elijah. Elijah's there, and uh, Elisha's just waiting on him. Master, you, you, you didn't wash your hands before you eat. You, can, I, can I give you some water? Yeah, whatever. These locusts, they don't need much anything. You know, I don't have to wash my hands. <laughs> Imagine Elijah, whenever he would teach his Bible class, he's up there teaching Elijah's up there teaching, and uh, you PBI guys will like this. He's up there teaching, and little pieces of locusts are flying out. <laughs> Amen. Oh, my goodness. I'll never forget one time we were, uh, Dr. Rutman's up there teaching, and uh, he had the little, well, he, he didn't have the little pointer thing with the laser on it when we were there. He had a stick. Y'all remember the stick? And he's pointing with the stick. He couldn't find his stick. So he's up there teaching away. All of a sudden, he just goes out the door. And you hear the microphone, you hear him out there trampling around in the woods, and all of a sudden, pff, pff, he breaks off a stick, and he comes back in with this big, ugly oak stick. It had, uh, uh, you know, moss growing off the side of it, and just a straight face, you know, he's just up there, you know, pointing. I was telling you over here, here's this line, oh, oh yeah, man, oh yeah, man, and this line, it goes all the way. You follow this line, it goes all the way around the world, the same place. And, he's, and we're just all rolling. I don't remember anything he was saying. We're just laughing at the guy. I picture Elijah kind of like that. He wasn't all uh, polished. He wasn't a professional preacher. He wasn't a minister. What do you do? Well, I preach. What are you? I'm a preacher. Amen. Notice his following. He followed Elijah. So not only do we have the consequence of our faith, we have the content of our faith, and let's wrap it up. Let's talk about the con continuing of our faith, the continuing of our faith. Go to 2 Kings chapter number 2, this place we started off, 2 Kings chapter number 2. There's lessons to impart, and then there's a legacy to leave behind. The lessons to impart, you'll notice in the first verse, the Lord tells Elijah, I'm going to take you up. Well, the Bible tells us that He's going to take him up. And notice what he tells Elisha in verse number 2. Terry here, I pray thee. The lessons to impart. Here's the question. There are two questions. Number one, will you pause? Will you tarry? Will you pause? I think Elijah is saying, Elisha, the Lord's done sent me down to Bethel. You just stay here. Are you serious? I think the question is, are you serious? Elijah is just going to do what he's going to do, and he's going to see if this guy's really serious or not. Yeah. yeah, it's been 10 years. He's proven pretty faithful, but does he really have what it takes? Right. Wow. The Lord is going to put you through a test as you come down this mountain to see if your faith is going to continue if it will be transferred into daily life. There's one thing to have your faith up here between your ears. It's another thing to have it in your heart. And it's another thing to live it out in your walk. Amen. Right belief should affect right behavior. Yes. But are you real serious? I don't know how you other pastors do this, but I do not pester people. And I'm not. And by the way, the church does not replace the family. Amen. Let me just go ahead and let me go ahead and just ease your burden a little bit. At our church, we don't have to have family day. We don't have to have an arcade game. We don't have to have a gym. We don't have to have activities. We don't have to have five activities every week to keep everybody in church. Sometimes you don't need to be in church. Sometimes you need to be with your family at your house. Good preaching. Amen. I like that. Dispensationally, God created the human family before He ever created the church. Amen. I'm not going to pester people. Right. I think Elijah's like, hey, i got to go do such and such. You stay here. Just to see what he's going to do. Hey, we have uh, discipleship. Uh, it's called 10 o'clock a.m. Sunday school. 
If, I, if you can't show up for Sunday school, I'm not going to show up at your house and try to disciple you. Get your blessed assurance in Sunday school where it belongs. And Wednesday night, that's some great discipleship time, Wednesday night. Just take some pressure off of you. Look, you don't have to replace everything. Hey, if you're going to be there, be there. If not, I'm not going to knock on your door. Now, I will say this. The folks that are very, very faithful in our church, Kind of like the Peter, James, and Johns. You know, you look at that whole thing. You got the 12, but then you got the Peter, James, and Johns. And Andrew kind of pops in there every now and again. There's a couple things Andrew pops in on, you know. He's kind of like the little blip. Boop, boop, boop. You got the three, and you got the little blip. Boop, 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 boop. Little Andrew, you know. But out of Peter, James, and John, you got John. He didn't ever say, is it I? He knew he wasn't going to betray Christ. But those that are real faithful and they don't come, they miss church or something, hey, there's something wrong. I'm going to check on so-and-so. Reminds me of the story of the old man. He didn't show up on Wednesday night. This is back in the, in the day when uh, uh, people began to use uh, tractors and things like that. They came out of the, uh, the, the old plow days and they began to get tractors and use those kind of things. Well, this guy, he was a farmer. He always was in church. I mean, he could set your clock by him being in church. And he missed church on a Wednesday night. So all the members after church said, hey, we better go out to Farmer Joe's house. And check on him. They went out there and lo and behold, that tractor had turned over and had him pinned. And they were able to save his life. Because they knew something was wrong because he wasn't in church. Those are the kind of people I'll check on. But I'm not just going to pester everybody and say, come on, come on, we're going to make it easy for you. We will help you. We will give you some cotton candy. Just look under your pew and there's a hundred dollar bill under every pew. I love this church. Hey. <laughs> hey, if you get him if, if you get him with a lollipop, you're going to have to keep him with a lollipop. Elijah says, Hey, I'm going, I'll see you later, man. Elisha's like, I'm going with you. You tell me no or not, I'm going with you. It's not up for the older generation to pester you. It's up for us, the younger generation. I conclude myself. I'm becoming the old guy. To chase after the Lord. So notice in the text here, Elijah tells him, Hey, will you pause? Will you just put everything on pause until next summer camp? Everything you did up here and how close you got to God, you just put it on pause, go back down, live out your year, and then resume it when you get back up here? Or are you going to continue your faith down the mountain? Will you pause? The second thing, will you, the other question is, will you progress? Will you progress? Notice how this thing starts off in verse number one there at Gilgal. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 6, let us go on unto perfection. We are to strive. We are to move forward. You know the kind of preachers I like to be around? The preachers that are growing. Yes. Amen. The preachers that are continuing. I'm trying to get closer to Jesus than I was last year. Amen. I'm trying to become a better Christian, a better follower, a better husband, a better preacher than I was last year. I'm trying to grow in my faith. It's not just up for the new Christians to grow. All of us should be progressing, not pausing. Will you progress? Notice it starts off at Gilgal. We don't have time to go through all these references, but Gilgal was the place that the cross was applied to the flesh. Gilgal was the place when they came over into the land, they were able to eat the corn, but the Bible says they had to circumcise everybody a second time. Before they could ever put the sword on the enemy, they had to put the sword on themselves first. I'm crucified with Christ. You have to start there as a Christian. But then you move on to Bethel. What is Bethel? Well, Bethel has a lot of significance in the Old Testament and in the Jewish religion. Obviously, we think of Abraham, and Bethel means house of God. Later on, when Jacob goes back and has his experience there, he calls it El Bethel. God, the house of God. In other words, God comes before the house of God. And you know, the house of God was that place where Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had put up one of those idols. Dan and in Bethel. Dan was in the north and Bethel was in the southern part of the kingdom of Israel there. 
And he had put one of those idols. You know what the house of God needs and our body's the temple of the living God? The house needs cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. Twice in Christ's ministry, once at the beginning and once at the end, he goes in and he cleans house. Yes. If you're going to progress in your Christian faith, if you're going to continue in your faith, then not only does the cross have to be applied, the house of God's got to be cleaned. Yes. And I believe it's a daily cleansing. Paul yes. said, I die daily. Amen. We have to be renewed. We, we uh, confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And then they move on where? They move on to Jericho. That's the place of victory. But you know back in 1 Kings chapter 16, you don't have to turn there. That place of victory can come back to haunt you. In 1 Kings chapter 16, the Bible tells us what happened. And Joshua said it was going to happen. Joshua prophesied, we've destroyed this city, but there's going to be a, boy, a guy born, and he's going to come up, and he is going to rebuild this city. And it's a cursed city. The devil will use your victories to haunt you. And you better go on further for more victories. You can't be like Obadiah, the compromiser, who just lives off past successes. The idea is to move forward. You know what? I've got some challenges in front of me when I come down off of this mountain, and I've got to implement what God's done for me for my faith to continue. For me to transfer my faith into real life, I've got to put into practice so I can defeat the enemy ahead of me. Instead of just thinking about all the victories of the past. The past is over with. You can't live off the past. Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and then you get to Jordan. What a place, man. Elijah, he crosses Jordan. The Lord Jesus Christ, we know about his experience at the Jordan River when he's baptized. And of course, Moses dies in that area. And you read about this, you understand the significance of it. Back in Joshua chapter number 1, when they cross over there, they took some stones on the other side, and they, the water parted, and they put the stones there from the past, and then when that water came back over, there's a burial there, and we're buried with him by baptism. There's a death, and the old past is buried up. And then they took stones out of Jordan, and they went across on the side of victory, and they set them up to remind them of the victory that God's given them. And so what you have with Jordan is you have the power that comes from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Will you progress? Will you move forward? There's a whole lot more to the Christian life than John 3.16. John 3.16 is kind of like Amazing Grace to me. It's one of those, yes. Amazing Grace is the anthem of the Christian religion. John 3.16 will be one of the great verses of the Christian religion. But you know, you have to move past John 3.16. Yes. You've got to go to resurrection ground. Yes. So here's the two questions. He says, uh, will you pause? Will you progress? So it's not just lessons to impart. I think Elijah's teaching in this, but there's a legacy to leave behind. What happens? Go to 2 Kings 2 and look what happens. He says, hey, I want a double portion of thy spirit. Now Elijah finally got to the place when he went that far. And by the way, the question doesn't come until after he goes from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. Elijah didn't ask him after they got to Gilgal and says, what do you want? He didn't ask him when they got to Jericho, what can I give you? He waited until they crossed over Jordan. And he says, what can I give you? He says, I want a double portion. Elijah says, you've asked a hard thing, verse number 10. If thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. It came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He's basically saying, I see you, I see you. And then Elijah knows he sees him. He saw him no more, took his own clothes and rent them in pieces and he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Now it says it fell from him, but maybe I'm giving, giving me a little license here. It's almost like Elisha calls out, and then Elijah's like, he sees me. He's got it. He's got it. He takes that mantle and drops it over there. Now here's what has to happen, verse number 12. He rents his own clothes in two. 
You have to put off the old man. There has to be a renting. The old man's got to be put off before you can ever put the mantle on. There's a few things the mantle represents. Obviously, there's the man of the mantle. That's Elijah. There's the ministry of the mantle. I mean, when somebody saw Elijah, they saw him and his leather girdle about his loins, and they saw his mantle. That was, that's what people saw when they saw Elijah. Now when they see Elisha, they're going to see Elisha wearing Elijah's mantle. There's the man of the mantle, but there's the message and the ministry of the mantle. We could say there's the method of the mantle. You know, God says you need to go on the old paths. Elisha does some new things. You ever read about those wells that uh, Isaac digs up over there in Genesis? It's the wells that his father, it's the same wells. But the Philistines have filled them up with dirt and he dug them up. And, they're, and he, he, and he uh, gives them some names. It's the same well, but it's a new well. In other words, anything that we do that's quote unquote new has got to be based on the old paths. And so that mantle, you only, not only have the man of the mantle and the ministry of the mantle, you have the method of the mantle. God blesses His paths. And I'm glad we're here and we haven't had to pull down the screen. We haven't had to turn on the canned music. We hadn't had to get the praise team up here. And here we are in 2024 and bless God, old time, old fashioned, Bible preaching still gets the job done. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's the old paths. So, well, you know, I just like to read my Bible on my iPad. You better watch that stuff. You better watch that hypnotic state that those screens put you in. Now look, you have eye trouble. I've got some men in my church. I've got two men in my church who can only see out of one eye. And they have to use these screens to help them where they can even read the thing. That's the exception. But I'm glad to see real Bibles. You turn, this is called a book. You turn the pages of the book. You know what's going to happen eventually? AI, which I call Antichrist Intelligence. AI. Eventually AI is going to take over these little electronic Bibles. This is all just, this is, this is uh, do theology. It's my initials, D-E-W, do theology. And what are you going to do when AI technology changes the Bible as you read it? You better get you a, a book. You better stick to the old paths. I know there's some new things happening. I know they didn't have YouTube 20 years ago. I know even 150 years ago they didn't have television and radio and all those kind of things. There's some new things, but it's still the old paths. The method, the ministry, the man of the metal. Uh, of, of the mantle. The message of the mantle is the same. The muscle of the mantle. <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you a double portion. Like I said, Elisha does double the miracles. Now here's the final thing. We'll wrap it up. What happens is that mantle falls and he goes over and before he ever puts the mantle on, he's got to rent his clothes in two. You can't mix the old and new man. Oh. Brother's testimony last night was good when he talked about the this is the old man. This is what the old man did. But now this is what the new man. The new man replaces the old man. Elisha is never the same. For your faith to continue from this mountaintop, your faith has to change you where you're not the same. The old man is dead and buried. Now you put on the new man that comes down from heaven. Now you do things on the earth with a power, a special power that comes from the man that went up above. The man that ascended far above all heavens. The field principalities and powers. The Lord Jesus Christ. Once you're saved, your spirit is joined unto the Lord. You've got a double dose. Brother Rob, we were talking about that. Brother Robert, we were talking about that. you got a double dose. Not only do you have your own spirit. Not only do you have your conscience that says, hey, that ain't right. Now you've got the Holy Spirit of God that is ignited and lit up by the Word of God. So instead of, you might not do that, that's not, maybe that's not good. Quit it! <laughs> or like we say down south, eh, eh, eh. 
I think all languages, Japanese, Chinese, yeah. Mex uh, Mexican language. Yeah. <laughs> My song leader always says, Mexican. Here's how everybody can understand this. The Holy Spirit comes in and says, eh. yeah. <laughs> What does that mean? That means thou shalt not. Yeah. You got a yeah. double dose. They take the old man he's renting to and now you got the new man. But notice this thing about the mantle here. When you think about what happened in 1 Kings 19, Elijah had put the mantle on him at his calling. Remember that? But now Elisha must put the mantle on every day. You see, he put the mantle on once. He just went up there and threw the mantle across his shoulders. He took it back off of him. Elisha wore that. Elijah wore that mantle. It was put on him once. Now Elisha, every single day, has got to put off the old man and put on the new man. For that double portion of that power. That's the only way our faith's going to continue, brothers and sisters, in this last days. That's the only way you're going to make it. Is to be able to put on the power of the mantle from the man in heaven. Finally, I want to ask this question. This will be done. You know, when Elijah smites the water, I like that, verse number um, 14, when he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Because that shows you the power is not in the mantle. The power is in the God of the mantle. Okay. It's the same thing with the staff later on with Elisha and his servant. He takes that staff. He goes, go lay my staff on the child. The, the, the servant thought the power was in the staff. The power's not in the staff. The power's not in the mantle. The power wasn't in the ravens. The power wasn't in the brook. The power wasn't in the widow woman. It's all God. But here's the question, not, look in verse number 12, if I can take a little liberty again. He says, not verse 12, verse 14, he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Here's my question. Are you going to continue in your faith? Here's the question. Not where is the Lord God of Elijah. But this is the question. Where are the Elijahs of God? Maybe where are the Elishas of God? Are you an Elijah or an Elisha? Are you, are you ready to continue your faith? Are you ready to transfer what God's done for you up here down into the valley? Be a good prayer of dedication this morning to say, yes. okay, Lord, we can't do this but by your help. So, God, would you help us? Yes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the text. Thank you for these rich truths. Lord, help us. In our own strength, we'll fall, God, but I pray that you give us a double portion that we can continue what we've got up here on the mountain, down in that valley. We ask it for Jesus' sake and his help. Amen.